Welcome to our latest edition of Deep Dive featuring Hudson Institute, Jonathan Hassan. And today we will focus on a long list of issues, particularly here in the Middle East, implications for the broader region, but also, of course, for the United States, for Europe and elsewhere. To deliberate all of that, let's now turn to Washington, D.C., where I, I'm joined by my colleague, Mr. Marshall Billingsley, formerly an Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Countering Terror Financing, uh, the Deputy Secretary General of NATO, among a long list of other uh, senior positions, and last but not least, of course, a senior fellow at Hudson Institute. It's good to see you, Marshall. See you too, Jonathan. It's a pleasure indeed. I'd like to uh, start by quoting U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who spoke earlier today alongside Israeli President Yitzhak Herzog prior to his meetings with both Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu and Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, during the course of which he says as follows, this is a decisive moment, probably the best and maybe the last opportunity to get the hostages home, to get a ceasefire and to put everyone on a better path to enduring peace and security. I'm here as part of an intensive diplomatic effort on President Biden's instructions to try to get this agreement to the line and ultimately over the line. It is time for it to get done. What are we to make out of this uh, statement and to what degree is the ongoing talks, the ongoing negotiations uh, truly at a uh, critical juncture in trying to reach some sort of outline for an arrangement? Well, I'm, obviously, we all very much would like to see an arrangement uh, whereby the hostages are finally released uh, and the bodies of those who Hamas has tortured and killed are, are returned. Uh, but of course, in the midst of this negotiation, what does Hamas do but deploy another suicide bomber to conduct a massive attack in Tel Aviv, which was, I think, um, only thwarted by uh, some workplace injury, as, as, as uh, the Israelis might call it. But uh, we're not in a, in a good place, and I don't think a deal is imminent. Hamas seems to have backtracked in the past uh, day or so. Uh, this is a terror organization, and they are committed to the destruction of the state of Israel, and we and the government of Israel should be committed to their destruction. Let's now turn to London, the UK, where we're joined by Colonel or retired Colonel Joel Rayburn, formerly a senior director of the NSC in Washington for Syria, for Lebanon, for Iraq, for Iran, a US Special Envoy for Syria, alongside a long list of other positions, uh, the last of which, of course, is uh, uh, the uh, founding director of the American Center for Levant Studies. It's good to see you, Colonel. I'd like to ask you uh, with regard to the current tensions with the Iranians. Uh, we just heard the spokesman of the Iranian foreign ministry, Nasir Knanani, coming out and emphasizing that irrespective of the outcome of the negotiations in Doha with regard to the prospects of a ceasefire, Iran is determined to launch an attack against Israel in concert with its proxy throughout the region. Yeah, I think that means uh, probably that the Iranian regime, which was, I, I think they were buying time so that they could find some kind of target that was probably not inside Israeli territory, but would be an Israeli target, potentially abroad or elsewhere in the region. Uh, they were looking for some kind of operation uh, uh, to get up to speed. And they needed that time. They used the Gaza negotiations as a reason uh, to stall that, and also as a reason not to uh, launch into a direct confrontation with Israel, which they uh, would have lost by going up the escalation ladder to, to a point where they couldn't follow. So I, I take it as a sign that there is a, there's probably an impending operation coming and that they found where they want to, where they think they want to hit, uh, just where they're trying to calibrate. I mean, we've discussed this before. I think they're trying to calibrate not having to do a direct confrontation. They they, they need to do some sort of attack for their own credibility in the, uh, within the region, uh, but also at home, so that they don't appear weak and vulnerable. So they have to they have to strike back somehow. I think that's probably their calculus, but they don't want to strike back directly in a way that would either be defeated and make them look even weaker, or 
that would prompt an Israeli response, which would then be overwhelming and do serious damage uh, to the regime, which the attack inside Tehran against Ismail Haniya demonstrated that Israel is capable of, if it was in fact Israel that did it. So that I take that as, as that sign, that there's something in the offing uh, that's probably ready. But on top of that, I think a few days ago, Rafael, your colleague Rafael Bardahi said something on this show that I thought was quite uh, apt when he said that the, the United States essentially uh, effectively discouraged Yahya Senwar from reaching a deal when President Biden said that, well, the way to prevent an Iranian attack against Israel is for Yahya Senwar to agree to a deal. Well, if you're Yahya Senwar and you want Iran to attack Israel, then you've just been shown that you shouldn't make a deal so as to make an Iranian response inevitable. So, I mean, th those those uh, negotiations were always doomed. I think in the larger sense, there's also the larger thing to consider, which is that we are now, we're in a period of great political uncertainty, especially in the United States. And I think the prospects for any kind of large diplomatic agreement in that environment, especially with a president of the United States who is a lame duck and who has lost a lot of credibility because of being a lame duck and having to step down as the nominee uh, for, for re-election, no one's going to make a big deal uh, in that environment. So I don't expect there there to be any anything like that that would that could be used as a diplomatic impetus to forestall an Iranian attack, et cetera. Indeed. Let's now turn elsewhere in Israel, where we're joined by Brigadier General in Reserve Yossi Kupilvasa, formerly the head of the IDF Intelligence Directorate's Research and Assessment Unit, as well as the Director General of the uh, Israeli Ministry uh, for Strategic Affairs, currently the project director at the uh, Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. It's good to see you, General. I'd like to ask you okay. particularly about both those aspects that we just heard from both uh, uh, Billingsley and uh, Colonel Rayburn. Uh, what are we to take from, on the one hand, the negotiations, on the other hand, Iran's continued aspirations to launch an attack, be it symmetric or asymmetric, against Israel. And then what also uh, Dr. Bardahi, who is also a good friend of yours, uh, mentioned uh, a couple of days ago, that Yahya Sinwal, the political and military leader of the Islamist Hamas in Gaza, has no reason uh, to acquiesce to the American request to reach an arrangement at this point in time and is eager to forestall the discussions as long as possible with the hope that it may turn into a wide-scale regional conflagration that would in turn ratchet up pressure upon the Israeli government that would uh, potentially force it to succumb to Hamas demands to leave, potentially, the Philadelphia Corridor, which is a no-starter from Israel's perspective on the strategic level. Well, you analyze it very well on the... The point is that uh, the only thing that would make uh, Sinwar move forward towards a deal is growing in, uh, military pressure by Israel. The more the, uh, the higher the price we ex extract from him for refusing to go to, to a deal that is acceptable to Israel, uh, the greater the chances are that he is going to move in this direction. And uh, what we're seeing in the last couple of days is that Israel keeps uh, putting pressure on, uh, on Hamas in Gaza, keep uh, Taking uh, more and more uh, lives of uh, terrorists in, in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip, in order to send a message to Sinwar: Look, uh, you can, you think you can pay for time and uh, wait for the wide-scale uh, regional uh, conflict? Uh, it's an option, yes, but uh, at the same time, you are paying a price for that, and you have to decide. And I hope that uh, during that time, we should be able to reach uh, Sinwar himself if we can. It's, uh, we did reach uh, Muhammad Def, and we, we, are, we were very close to Sinwar, with Muhammad Def and Mawanisa and, and others. So it's, uh, we have to, to make the, the final move and get to him. Uh, and he knows that every day that passes by, we get closer. And uh, that's something he has to take into account. On the other hand, it's true. Everything you said is true. The American position that is seen as putting pressure on Israel to show more flexibility is uh, not uh, convincing uh, Sinwar to um, show uh, readiness to, to make concessions. 
and uh, the uh, feeling that he can use this uh, no deal, yes deal situation in order to uh, promote the chances of a wide scale uh, uh, escalation in the in the region is something that uh, is of course uh, to his liking. And if he can do that, uh, he would not uh, show any uh, readiness to sh to soften his position. That's why we hear that uh, Hamas saying uh, we are not we are not willing to participate in the talks, and uh, we are not uh, satisfied with the what's happening. And uh, they put the blame on, on the United States first and foremost, and on Israel later, trying to put pressure on the United States to put more pressure on Israel to soften its position on uh, things that uh, are at the core of the of the discussion, which is the question of who is going to be uh, victorious in the end of this war. Is it Israel or Hamas? And if it is Hamas, it's not only Hamas, it's also Iran and uh, Hezbollah. And that's why Iran and Hezbollah are ready to use this excuse in order to uh, allegedly postpone their reaction. Uh, because if they can come up eventually with a deal in which uh, Israel is not present along the Philadelphia corridor, which allows Hamas to uh, regroup and uh, rearm itself, and uh, allows Hamas to say in the, in the end of the day, Look, what we did in Sarah on the 7th of October was justified, uh, strategically st justified, not only uh, from a moral point of view, but also from a strategic point of view was justified. Then uh, this is a deal that's very dangerous, not only for the for Israel. Of course, it's dangerous for Israel. It's also dangerous for the for the free world and uh, for the United States itself. But uh, the Americans now are in a, in a different position than Israel. They most most of all want to prevent uh, regional uh, escalation. And uh, they are more worried about uh, the situation of the Palestinian uh, Palestinian civilians living in Gaza than they are about uh, the security of Israel in the long term. They are committed to Israel security, but in the order of priorities, uh, in getting a deal that would uh, guarantee better lives for the Palestinians living in Gaza is considered to be more uh, critical than caring about Israel security. From an Israeli security point of view, of course, the most important thing is to make sure that uh, we remain at, uh, along the Philadelphia corridor, preventing Hamas from rearming and sending a clear message to Hamas and to everybody else that uh, the 7th of October was a strategic mistake and uh, that uh, there is a price to pay for for making this, this kind of mistakes. This is what what's at stake at this position. Unfortunately, we and the Americans don't see things eye to eye. Unfortunately, uh, since uh, it seems quite obscure, but when uh, you're talking about victory for Hamas means victory for Iran, on the other uh, side of this coin is victory for Israel means victory for America and for the West. Why don't they see it that way in Washington, though, Marshall? Well, part of the reason they don't see it that way in Washington is because they don't see it that way in Chicago, where the Democratic National Convention is currently uh, kicking off. Uh, as we've seen in recent days, the Democrat Party has a uh, has a, a vocal and well-organized faction that has expressed, in some cases, direct solidarity with Hamas, but certainly uh, has, has expressed an anti-Israel bias and a pro-Palestinian bias. And with the convention uh, being held and the expectation that there will be significant protests or riots, I'm sure there's nothing that the Biden-Harris, but especially the Harris-Waltz team, wants more than to be able to crow about a ceasefire with Israel. So I would imagine that the pressure right now on the government of Israel from the Biden lame duck administration uh, is enormous. Uh, but that said, uh, it's clear that Hamas is not interested in a deal, uh, as, as Joel and, and Yosef have said. But Look, not just the suicide bomber that uh, that detonated himself, but there were 70 drone attacks yesterday. There was another attack out of Iraq with a, with a further drone. Um, this is not the behavior of an apparatus of an organization that's interested in a deal. Absolutely. Uh, Colonel Rayburn, I'd, I'd like to zoom out a little bit and, and ask you for uh, a analysis on the current state of play vis-a-vis -vis Lebanon, where are we seeing the current trajectory headed? Well, if you're talking about the the idea, the, the initiative to try to get uh, via the Lebanese government uh, in agreement with Hezbollah and its allies to implement UNSCR 1701 at long last, that's going nowhere and it's not going to happen. Th that would under, as, as Yossi just mentioned, you know, 
the, the principle that he noted with Yahya Sinwar, where Sinwar is only going to make a deal if he's under irresistible military pressure at this stage. There's no political pressure to be brought to bear against him. The same thing holds tr true in the north. Hezbollah is only going to agree to back off. They're only going to agree to something that would be acceptable to everybody else, including the United States, if they're under irresistible military pressure. Either that, I guess, or if they were if they were bought off and the Iranians were bought off with some kind of massive windfall. But there's no there in this political season, a U.S. administration is not going to be able to do that sort of thing, even a lame duck one uh, in the way, for example. I mean, they can't strike. There's the U.S. administration right now is, is essentially becalmed and doesn't have the juice to be able to do some kind of large deal like the JCPOA in 2015, or the hostage deal at the end in 2016, which involved billions, or even something that's more limited, like the, the maritime boundary agreement between Lebanon and Israel. There's just not enough credibility. I think, you, you know, you're dealing now with a U.S. administration that is entire, it's not just the president who's a lame duck, it's everyone that works for him, other than Kamala Harris. Because in five months from tomorrow, there's going to be a new president of the United States. And that new president of the United States is likely going to have a new secretary of state, secretary of defense, national security, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down the line. So every single one of those Biden administration senior officials, including Tony Blinken, is 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 dealing, it has does not have the, di the diplomatic oomph, the diplomatic uh, juice, to be able to deliver some kind of uh, major agreement, which is what it would take at this point. I've been a diplomat in a lame duck administration myself at the end of 2020 and the first few weeks of 2021. You can't do anything. You cannot accomplish anything. People will be courteous and uh, and and friendly to, to, to see you, but there's nothing major that you can deliver. And the Biden administration's already in that situation. That means there will be no diplomatic initiative to resolve any of these conflicts in the next several months, certainly not before uh, the, pres the U.S. presidential election, because the U.S. is a factor in, in, these, uh, in these conflicts. So what what are the means by which these conflicts would be resolved? It's it, it's only I mean, it's going to wind up being military means or it's just going to be muddling through until there's another U.S. president, which actually I think is more likely. General Kupelvaso, is it inevitable at this point in time or are we going to muddle into this process of, as uh, Colonel Rayburn just mentioned, of waiting for the next president? Uh, with uh, hopes that uh, the other side will not miscalculate to the point of no return? Well, there are two lines that may lead us to uh, different result. One is the uh, how far are we going to go in, in Gaza? And um, many forces in Israel say, well, we did enough, uh, let's uh, leave it at that. Uh, these are not the, this is not the government, but uh, important uh, voices in Israel that are saying that. And they are supported by the United States, who was also, as you've seen in the New York Times, trying to convince us that uh, we've done enough and uh, enough is enough. Let's bring an end to that and uh, uh, we'll find some uh, solution, uh, some phrasing of the issue of uh, Philadelphia and uh, we shall uh, move on. But uh, there is also the option of putting more pressure, as I said before, on Hamas uh, to the point where that uh, Hamas will have to accept something that is not really ready to accept now. If we manage to do that, then this is, may uh, have an impact on what's happening in, in Lebanon and uh, and vis-a-vis -vis Iran as well, because uh, the message to to Lebanon will be, okay, we haven't yet started to act uh, in a more forceful manner towards you, but we can do that, and we have just proven that we can get a positive result if we do that in in Gaza. So uh, my, mind that when you make your calculations, and maybe it's better for you to go along with the American proposals for uh, some sort of uh, diplomatic solution to the situation in the North, rather than go through all the agony of uh, confrontation, of military confrontation. This is a possibility. So this is one line that uh, may lead. It's not necessarily going to happen, but it may lead to a positive result in the North without a war. Otherwise, we shall have to uh, fight in the North in order to convince Hezbollah to accept the conditions of 
that our president is doing right now without him. And the second line is uh, what happens if uh, uh, the uh, Iranians and Hezbollah feel that they cannot wait any longer. Uh, they were too deeply humiliated. Uh, they, they are so frustrated. They have to do something against Israel. Uh, the bombing this uh, that was uh, miraculously uh, avoided uh, last night in uh, in Tel Aviv was taken responsibility for by uh, Hamas and the Islamic Jihad. But it may have well been presented as the Iranian response or Hezbollah response to, to what happened uh, to them uh, when Fuad Shukar and Ismail Aniya lost their lives. So uh, this is one way of uh, action that... Uh, Iran and Hezbollah can use in order to uh, try to maintain some sort of deniability and at the same time show that they are able to extract uh, heavy prices from Israel. Uh, but if they if they choose something different, something that goes directly from their territory, either from Lebanon or from uh, Iran, towards Israel, this uh, will uh, almost inevitably uh, lead to a wide-scale escalation. Israel is going to retaliate, of course. Uh, it has already, has already committed to that. So this is another uh, track that may lead to escalation. Indeed. Just, uh, just to note on the uh, suicide, uh, attempted suicide explosive uh, that was detonated uh, prematurely, it was roughly one and a half miles away from a full uh, soccer stadium, uh, which uh, showcased there a, a uh, game between two major uh, teams, uh, the consequences could have been devastating, naturally, uh, with the target being civilian. Uh, we need to put that in mind. Uh, if that would have happened, uh, all hell would have broke loose uh, in the Middle East, and that uh, was averted. Uh, somebody in the ISA here in Israel... Well, it, was, it was happening like uh, 10 meters away from... Uh synagogue that was also full with right. uh, all kinds no, of ceremonies. No, 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 it was a miracle. Uh, I, I'll, I'm going to put it on that. But uh, we're drawing near to the end of the program, and I'd like to give each and every one of you uh, the opportunity to provide a uh, weak trajectory. Um, Marshall, if I may ask you to focus on the deepening relations between Russia and the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, which obviously we're, we're hearing reports about large quantities of ballistic uh, missiles being uh, diverted from Iran towards uh, the Russian Federation for its war of aggression in Ukraine. What can you tell us about that? Well, <clears throat> we're, we're obviously very, very concerned about that uh, relationship, which has been there for quite a while, but has now reached all-time highs. So yes, there's been a lot of press reporting regarding the furnishing of different ballistic missile systems by the Iranians to the Russians, uh, but it's going to be a two-way street. So what is it that Iran is getting in exchange? They're not particularly desperate for cash, given how the Biden-Harris administration has walked away from enforcement of all the sanctions on the regime in Tehran. So one must suppose that they're getting something else from the Russians. Uh, and here I want to draw your attention to, to a critical matter. We, we should not mirror image the Iranians uh, by believing necessarily that they have some overwhelming need to immediately retaliate for the targeted strikes that have happened in the past month or two. The Iranians are playing a very different game right now. Specifically, since 2019, our intelligence community has reassured Congress repeatedly that Iran had not taken steps to engage in nuclear weapons fabrication for the purpose of producing a testable device. For the first time since 2019, just this past month, our intelligence community was unable to make that assurance. So Iran is very systematically and steadily moving forward, potentially to the fabrication of not one, but multiple nuclear weapons. And this should be a foremost concern for all of us. Colonel Rayborn, uh, very briefly on the latter point made by Marshall, uh, in the event that the Iranians do Make, take that decision to break out uh, on testing a nuclear device. Uh, do you see the United States in this period of time? I know that both uh, you, Marshall, as well as Yossi have uh, voiced the alarm about this possibility. If they make those tests during this period of time ahead of the uh, transition of power in Washington on uh, January 20th, uh, are we expected to see the United States stand by its word and thwart the Islamic Republic from fielding nuclear weapons? 
I don't know the current administration. I don't think. Uh, I well, I I suspect. I I think, but there will be a great deal of pressure on the current administration uh, to to reinstate the maximum pressure campaign. That's for sure. So I I think that's that's the case. But but again, I I go back to uh, Jonathan. I I don't know that at, at this point. Um, that the the Biden administration has the wherewithal uh, to respond to something like that, which is unfortunate and, and creates a we're in a window of danger, I I think uh, of of exactly this this kind of uh, you know wild card event. Thank you, uh, Colonel uh, General Kupelvasil. In forty seconds, which is all we have to give you, where is Israel heading from here? from a strategic perspective, are we expected to see more of the same or are we at the precipice of prospects for a all-out conflagration? Well, I think the prospects for all-out conflagration have grown considerably and we are getting closer and closer to the point where we finish the job in, in Gaza and uh, on top of uh, ongoing uh, clearing uh, the, the area, but uh, the major operations are close to be over which means that Israel has more forces to uh, send to the to other fronts. And uh, this is a major turner, uh, turning point in, the, in this uh, ongoing war with many, many fronts. And of course, uh, what was said here about uh, the potential of the Iranians to move forward with the use of this uh, window of darkness in order to uh, move towards uh, having a nuclear weapon uh, is, is extremely dangerous from uh, Israel's point of view, and uh, Israel will have to do something hoping that uh, the United States will uh, support it. The fact that uh, the Americans have sent uh, some offensive weaponry uh, into the region, and not only defensive, is, is a new development that is, uh, I hope, taken uh, into account in, in Tehran. And, uh, but uh, we cannot uh, rely on the, Amer on the Iranians to take the right decisions. They have taken all kinds of dangerous uh, decisions in the past, and we can expect them to do them in the future too. Indeed. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank General Kupelwasser, Colonel Rayburn, and Mr. Billingsley for all of your insights. And I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Until our next edition, from here in Jerusalem, wishing you a good evening.